Thank you. All praise to thee. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of the Song of Solomon, if you would please. And, and coming to the end of this book, and we'll look together at the last four verses of chapter 7 this evening, Song of Solomon chapter 7. And this has been a very special book to me over the last few months. And I hope it has been a blessing and beneficial to you. Song of Solomon chapter 7. And we will begin reading together in verse number 10, reading down to the end of the chapter. Song of Solomon chapter 7, beginning in verse number 10 down through the end of the chapter. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourisheth, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. The mandrakes give a smell, and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. Let's pray together and ask for the Lord's help this evening. Lord, we acknowledge that we need Thee, and all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. As we open Thy Word tonight, we ask of Thee to speak. Speak to hearts. We pray for those who are wandering, those who are wavering, those who are sitting on the fence this evening. Bring them back to Thee. Those who are very near, very near to salvation, but yet feel so far away, help them this evening, we pray. Encourage every heart and speak to us through thy word, we ask, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to this last, these last few verses of this chapter, chapter 7, and it's a beautiful portion of scripture because what we find here really are the results of Christ's love being revealed to his church. What should happen when you and I are convinced of his love for us? What should be the response when you are thoroughly convinced that Jesus Christ loves you? That's what we find in these verses. And I think one of the biggest challenges is for God's people to rest in the fact that he does love us. One of the most difficult things for God's people today is to believe that he does love me and that shall never change. And if you be born again, if you be a child of the living God, you can be assured that if you remember last week we looked at how Christ goes through such effort to prove his love to his bride. And what a comfort that is to our soul. If you are a child of the living God tonight, then you can be assured that he loves you. We say, well, doesn't he love everyone? And yes, he does. But there is a particular love that he has for his bride. That makes sense. Uh, just like I would say, I love you. Even in conversation, I might say to someone tonight after the meeting, I love you. But I love my wife a little bit more than I love you. In the same way, the Lord Jesus loves his bride more than he loves those who are outside of Christ. The same way I would say to each one of these children that I love them. But naturally you would say, surely you must love your own children more than the other children in this tent. The same way God looks down upon this earth and we can say with assurance that God so loved the world. But oh, to be accepted into the beloved. Oh, to be called his child. There's a different kind of a love there, isn't it? And I believe with all of my heart that God is willing and desiring to bring more into that love. More into that relationship where that love is poured out. In fact, John in ecstasy writes, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Amazing that we should be called the sons of God. And that's exactly what is being expressed here. And if you, if you remember last week, we looked at how, how the Lord Jesus proves his love to his bride by beckoning her to return, by bidding her to come back. And then he goes through such efforts to express through a word, picture how much he loves his bride, how fair and how pleasant she is to him. And by the end of it all, she says, I am my beloved. I believe that I belong to him. And not only that, but I also believe that he actually likes me. Isn't that a wonderful thought? 
Sometimes we think that, yes, he loves me because he has to love me because he's God. But actually, you read in Scripture, he loves you and he likes you. Amen. His desire is toward me, she says. She can't hardly believe it. This little shepherdess, this little farm girl, this little, in her own eyes, she says, I'm, 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 I'm altogether ugly, nothing good in me at all. I've been left out in the fields and I'm not, I am no longer attractive and nobody really wants me. But she's convinced that he does. And that's exactly the way that Christ wants you, Christian, to feel. To know that although you be full of sin and although you are not anything like you should be, his love is towards you. How precious. Now, what should that, what should that spark in the heart of a believer? What reaction is Christ looking for? And that's what we find in these four verses from verse 10 down to verse number 13. And I believe the first thing that Christ desires to see produced in you is hope. Hope. We are living in a hopeless world. But Jesus Christ labors to reveal himself and reveal his love to you that you might have hope in an ever depressing scenario. That you might have hope in a hopeless world. And I believe the Lord Jesus labors to reveal his love and consequently true hope. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look around at the world and think, this is really a hopeless mess. Speaking to a brother recently, and he said, this world is filled with evil people. Evil people. But it's amazing that when Christ reveals his love to you, it's amazing the response to think that you are loved by God. To think that you who for so long were rebellious and an enemy of God and you ran after your own sins, and even still there be remnants of that rebellion in your heart, still he loves you. What hope does that inspire? You see, our problem is that we oftentimes spend too much time looking at the darkness inside of us, and therefore we are thoroughly convinced after looking inside, we are thoroughly convinced that he can never love us instead of looking to him. The more you look at yourself, the more depressed you're going to become. But the more you look to Christ, the more hopeful you become. And perhaps tonight, for some of you, your, your biggest obstacle is getting your eyes off of yourself and putting them on the Lord Jesus Christ. What hope. And not just hope, but what expectancy. I mean, look at the words that she says after she says, I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. She's beginning to understand. Then she says, well, come, my beloved, and let us go forth into the field. Well, if you love me and if you really want to be with me, then let's go. And I believe that's what Christ is, is looking for. It's exactly what he's looking for in you. And why should we not hope? Why should we not expect him to come with us? Why should we not expect him to come with us if he really does love us? It's not a very hard thing to get my wife to go for a cup of coffee with me. I don't know if it's because she loves me or coffee, but one or the other. She loves me. And I love her. And therefore, it is not a laborious task for us to go and get time together. In fact, we spend most of our days pining for more time with each other. She said to me just the other day, can't we just go away? I said, yes, in, in, in the right time. That's the natural feeling and reaction when you know that someone loves you and when you know that you are loved by someone else and you share that same love. You can expect, you can hope to be with that person. And this is the hope that the New Testament speaks of over and over and over again. I, I am growing to love the book of Hebrews more and more, but Hebrews speaks so much of hope. In chapter 3 of Hebrews, in verse number 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? We have a confidence 
and a rejoicing of the hope. And the author of Hebrews says, hold on to it. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose your grip on the confidence we have in Christ and the hope we have in Christ. That we shall be with him. That we shall see him. In chapter 4 of Hebrews, in verse number 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. None of us will ever go boldly to the throne of grace unless we hope to be received. Unless we have a reason to believe that if I approach the throne of God, that God's actually going to listen to me. This is the hope we have because Christ loves me because he loves you. And so we have such hope and such boldness. We can say, come on, Lord Jesus. And you might say, what a blasphemous thing. No, 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 no. What a privilege to know that he loves me and to know that I love him. And so, and therefore it is not a problem for me to say, Lord Jesus, would you come with me for a little while? You find it in Hebrews chapter 6, once again in verse number 9, you find this, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. The full assurance of hope. The Bible says we have a blessed hope. In chapter 6 and verse number 18, it speaks about two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie that we might have a strong consolation or a strong hope who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we has we have as an anchor of the soul. You know, we have, an, we have a hope that is like an anchor for your soul. Amazing. Chapter 7 of Hebrews in verse number 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. You see, the love of Christ puts hope in our heart, and by that hope we draw a little closer to God. It's an amazing thing. This is why Christ Jesus wants to reveal his love that we might have hope. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, a marvelous, marvelous chapter. I could read most of it, but I won't because of time. But it speaks about this man, Christ Jesus. And it says in verse 17, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That ought to give you a little bit of hope. Would you look this way? Did you hear that, boys? Sins and iniquities... Will I remember no more? All the things you've done wrong. Here's the hope that I have that when I approach God, I shall be received because he has chosen to remember no more my sins. And everybody said, Phew. amen. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Meaning where he wiped these all away, we no longer need another offering. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This is the hope we have. We rejoice in hope. And this is what Christ is looking for. When he, when he works to reveal his love in you, he's doing so that you might have more confidence and more hope, not in yourself, but in him, in his love. The more he reveals his love to you, the more confident you are that you are indeed loved of him. Think about a relationship. 
One of the ugliest things to be found in a marriage is jealousy. And jealousy is often there, not always, but often there when there is a lack of confidence. But when someone is assured of the other spouse's love, when a husband is assured of his wife's love, or a wife is assured of her husband's love, then there is a peace and a hope and a confidence. That's exactly what we find in the love of Christ. But there's something else that the Lord Jesus is looking for when he reveals his love. He wants to give you hope. And also by revealing his love, look at verse number 11. The bride says, come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Here's the second thing I believe in our text that Christ is looking for when he reveals his love to you. He's looking for a desire to be alone with Christ. The more Jesus reveals his love to you, the more you should want to be alone with him. The more you believe that he loves you, the more you are convinced that he loves you and he wants to be with you, the more you should naturally want to just get alone with him. Have you ever been in a crowd of people and thought, I just want to get out of here? Have you ever been in a crowd of people and thought, I just want to get out of here so I can get alone with God? That's what he's looking for. And that's what she's thinking. She was just in the middle of a congregation of the daughters of Jerusalem. And she said, look, come, my beloved, let us go forth into the, let's get out of here. Same thing my wife was saying just the other day. Can't we just get away? It's the same thing the bride was saying to her beloved Savior. Can't we just get away? I love this thought. One of the most precious books that was ever put into my hands was was a little rendition of the letters that Samuel Rutherford wrote. It's broken down into little bits and it's compiled into a short little book that is entitled The Loveliness of Christ. Little selections from the letters that Samuel Rutherford wrote to different people. Often many of those letters were written from a prison cell. And one of the things he said was this, Christ and his cross together are sweet company and a blessed couple. My prison is my palace. My losses are rich losses. My pain, easy pain. My heavy days are holy and happy days. Because if Christ is there, everything else will be okay. And that's exactly what she's saying. Let's get away from this and let's just get alone. Can you hear her? Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. I wonder this evening, do you have such a desire to be alone with Christ? Do you have a desire to be with him and him alone? Now, it's further expressed. Four times she says, let us, let us, let us, let us. Let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Look here for a moment. Here's what she says. I don't want to be with you for just a minute or two. I want to live with you. And I believe that the more you understand the love of Christ, the love that Christ has for you, the more you will just want to be with him. With unbroken communion. You want to walk as carefully as you possibly can. You want to have your ear open to him. You want to hear his voice. You, you, you want to be as close to him and only him as you possibly can. Not just for a moment or two every day, not just kneel by your bed at night and say your prayers, but you will want to live with Jesus. Let's get out of here. I want to live with you. She goes on. Let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Do you know when when you know that he loves you and wants to be with you and you begin to feel your love for him growing, you will want to get up early. And you'll want to get up early to be with him. You'll not want to get up early to check Facebook. You'll not want to get up early to see if you, you can be the first one to know the news on the BBC. You'll not want to get up early because the early bird gets the worm. You'll want to get up early because you just want to get alone with him. You find this pattern 
set for us by Jesus himself. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That's Jesus. Now, if Jesus got up early, long before it was day, and went to a place where he could get alone to pray, what do you think you and I ought to do? I was speaking to somebody recently about the prayer meetings, the 530 prayer meetings. They said, many people go to that? I said, well, uh, the right people are there. The Lord Jesus is there. And they said, yeah, it's a bit early, isn't it? It is early. And I don't believe at all. I'm not saying at all that if you're not here, you're somehow a second class Christian, I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying there ought to be something inside of you that wants to get up before the rest of the world gets up so you can meet your Lord. There should be something inside of you that stirs, and when you lay your head on your pillow at night, that says, I can't wait to get up in the morning because I can't wait to see him again. There should be something in you that desires his presence in an unhindered way, in a way that allows you and causes you to get up early before anyone else does so that your time with him can be undisturbed. Robert Murray McShane had a habit and a practice of getting up early to see his face before he saw anybody else's face. Can you imagine if all of us determined that we would get up in the morning and see his face before we saw the faces of anyone else? Can you imagine how different our lives would be? You say, well, surely he doesn't expect us to get up early, does he? I'm a bit of a night owl. Psalm chapter 5 and verse number 3, My soul, uh, pardon me, uh, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. In Psalm 57, in verse number 7, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Oh, awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will awake early. Early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. You see, they understood God was worthy. God was worthy of us crawling out of bed in the morning and acknowledging that there isn't anyone like him. Psalm 63, verse number one, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Do you know why he could say that? Do you know why David could say, early will I seek thee? Because the very next phrase says, my soul thirsteth for thee my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is he's saying i, I thirst for jesus just like if i lived in a drought and where there's no water as if i was passing through the sahara desert and was part my lips cracked and parched that's the way i'm thirsting for god and therefore it'd be no problem for me to get up early one of the reasons we're not willing to get up early is because we're just not thirsting for him. We're not thirsty for him. In Psalm chapter 130, maybe you want me to stop, but in Psalm chapter 130, verse number six, my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for for the morning, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. You know what he said? He said, I, I wait for the Lord more acutely, more carefully than those who are waiting to get to work in the morning to earn a bit more money. Now, it's always interesting to me that we usually have no problem getting up in the morning and going to work to earn a, a few shillings. We usually have no problem getting up to do the things we like to do and want to do. And here lies the problem. We should love 
and long and thirst to be with the one who loves us. How could we forget that famous verse in Matthew chapter 6? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Before you look for anything else, before you seek anything else, be, before you get to anything else and put your hand to anything else, seek Him. Proverbs 8 and verse number 17, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. Would you look here for a moment? Perhaps some of the re reasons that we are not finding Him is because we're not seeking Him early. I believe that when you see and begin to understand how much the Lord Jesus loves you and how much he wants to be with you, then you will have hope and you will also have a desire, an increasing desire to be with him. An increasing desire to be alone with him, an increasing desire uh, to get up early to be with him. Look what she says in our text in Song of Solomon chapter 7 and verse number 12. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourisheth. Now I believe there's a third thing that will be a natural effect of understanding Christ's love for you. First, there will be that hope instilled and imparted and then there will be a desire to be with him more and more and earlier and earlier. In fact, there'll even be a desire, David says, all the night long. But there's a third thing, I believe, that will be the result. When you, be, when you begin, when the penny begins to drop and you begin to see, he loves me. There's a third thing. I believe that there will be a longing for fruitfulness. You see, when you begin to realize just how much he loves you, you will want to express your love for him. It's kind of like at Christmas time. My wife and I usually have a bit of an agreement and we'll say, look, don't buy me anything. And she'll say, okay, just as long as you don't buy me anything. And if I buy her something, then she feels she wants to express her love as well. And so there's sort of this ping pong match going on. And in a sense, you find this here, that when Christ reveals his love to the bride, she wants to reveal her love to him. Now, can I ask you, would you look this way for a moment? When was the last time you deliberately and intentionally tried to reveal to Christ your love for him? When was the last time you went out of your way deliberately and intentionally to show him that you love him? You see, sometimes we have this idea, well, God knows everything, and so sometimes we do this with our husbands and wives, but she knows I love her. And so we'll care for everybody else, but the one that we should love the most. We'll express our love more openly to other people, but we take for granted that our spouse knows that we love them. But really, we should be doing all that we can constantly to affirm our love for our spouse. And how much more to affirm our love to Christ. You see, when you are assured of his love, you will desire to be with him and you will desire to give him as much as you possibly can. Listen to her words. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. The mandrakes give a smell, and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. Beautiful. Come, Jesus, come. Let's see if, if I'm growing. Jesus, come, please, come near. Come with me, and let's see if, if I'm growing and if there's any fruit for you. That's what he wants. When's the last time you invited Christ into your, to your inner life to see if there was any growth? We normally want him to stay out. Don't get too close unless you see the truth and reality. 
we would far rather talk about the fruit in our life than we would invite Christ in to see it. And she says, come, let's see if the vine flourish. And can I tell you something? The more you abide in Christ, the more you long to be in his presence and the more you dwell in his presence and run away with him and, and the more you spend time alone and get, alone, get up early to be with him, then believe me, the more your vine will flourish. The more fruit will be in your life. For some of you, the reason you see no fruit in your life is because you spend no time with Christ. How can you expect fruit when you spend no time with a husband and with a vine dresser? How could there be any fruit on the vine if you do not let the vine dresser do his work? And if you are not well acquainted with his tender hand. Let us see if the vine flourish. Whether the tender grape appear. Now you remember a while ago. You remember uh, that little portion of scripture. Where the Lord Jesus said. Let's watch out for those little foxes. That spoil the vine. Watch out for the little foxes. That spoil the vine and they rob, steal the tender grapes. And here she says, with confidence, let's go look. Because there be no foxes. Because we've dealt with the foxes together. We have dealt with those little foxes that spoil the vine, and therefore, come, let's see the vine is flourishing, and, and, and there are indeed tender, precious grapes. I have something to offer you. Can I ask you this evening, do you have anything to offer the Lord Jesus Christ? Are there any tender grapes? Are there any pomegranates budding? There will I give thee my loves. There ought to be something in the heart of every believer that says, I just want to give Christ as much evidence of my love as possible. You see, here is the difference between those who understand that they are saved by grace and those who believe that they are saved by their works. The difference is, I want to reveal to him my works because I want him to see that I love him. As an expression that I understand that he loves me. But those who believe in this, this working to obtain salvation, they are working, working, working to try to convince him to love them. But the truth of the matter is, here this little bride begins to recognize the only hope of fruit, the only hope of evidence, is if she believes that he does love her. And if it be revealed, there will I give thee my loves. I wonder this evening, have you given anything to Christ? Have you given your loves, plural, the best of the best? Have you reserved for him the deepest part of your heart and affection. I love what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. He makes it quite clear. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Look here for a second. Here's what Paul says. The only reason I am where I am today is the grace of God. And because of that grace, I have labored and worked harder than anybody. Why? Because he knows that God's grace was given to him. And he labors from that grace. He labors out of that grace that he might have something to give back unto his Lord. I wonder if you feel the same. George Burroughs wrote, Love prompts us to lay up for Jesus and consecrate to him our best gifts as well as our diligent services. You want to give him the best that you have. You want to give him the best that you are. You want to give him your best hours. One man said this, I ought to pray the two best hours of my day. I ought to give to the Lord in prayer my two best hours. What he meant by that was the two hours that he was most awake, most alert, most sharp in mind, those two hours I should give to God because he's worthy. I want to give him my best. He says in verse number 13, she says in verse number 13, the mandrakes give a smell and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. Can I ask you this evening, have you laid anything up for him? 
I'm reminded of a little parable. I will not comment much on it, but I will read some of it for you found in Matthew 25. It's the parable when the master gives to his servants talents. He gives unto them an expression of his love, an expression of his care. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, I'll read it for you. Look there with me. Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that hath received the five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them Five talents more. Get something to give. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Look, here, here's what's yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given and, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Would you look here for a moment? The problem was this man mis entirely misjudged his Lord. And can I, would you look here for a moment? There are many of us that have misjudged our Lord. And because of that, we sit in fear, waiting for his return. We take all that he has given us, and we do our best to hold on to it. In Luke, we read another version of this, where each man is given one talent. We, we do our best. One, one man hid it in a napkin. We hide away all that he's given, all that he's revealed. We're fearful because we do not know him. We do not know his love. We do not believe that he loves us. Instead, we think he's a hard man. We think he's a terrible God. We think he's a mean and cruel and angry God. And therefore, we live in fear, waiting for the day that he comes back. Can I tell you, you do not know the love of Christ. Because should you know his love, you would want to take his love and take all that he's given and you would labor and want to serve and give your life and give your time to have something to give back to him when he returns. You would do your very best. Oftentimes when I'm gone on a trip, uh, perhaps traveling in another country, or traveling here and there, when I come home, my children and my wife have prepared something special waiting for me. Why? Is it because I don't believe that they love me? No, it's because they know I'm coming home and uh, they've missed me and I've missed them and, and it is a happy reunion. Something has been prepared as an expression of their love for me and how they've been waiting for me. That's exactly what Christ wants to see. That you love him. That you understand his love and you have been waiting for his return. And you are waiting 
with great joy for his return. And that's why she says, I have stored up. There's all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O oh my beloved. Come. Now, can I ask you in closing, are you ready for him to come? Have you stored up treasures in heaven, not in earth? Have you anything prepared for when he returns? I'm not talking about your bank account. I'm not talking about any of that, but I'm talking about uh, those, those kinds of treasures that cannot be purchased with, with the money of this world and that can't even, cannot even be achieved apart from the grace of God. Where is your heart and where is your mind? The Lord Jesus in that same passage that he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He says, for where your heart is, there will also your treasure be. What is it that we can store up for him? What is it that we can offer him? I believe we can offer unto him glory due unto his name. We can offer unto him the sacrifice of praise. I believe there's much that we can labor towards the building and the extending of his kingdom. What a gift to be able to share with another believer, to demonstrate unto another believer the love of Christ. What a privilege. What a privilege to be able to be used of God to help steer a wayward one back into the way. What a privilege. What a gift to offer unto our Lord because we love him. Are you ready? I hope that you are and I hope that tonight we are preparing for his return. And that when he does return, he shall find much fruit. You speak often, we've, we've talked about this before, but... Christians speak often of crowns, don't they? Can't wait to go to heaven and where I can get my crown. Ooh, some people say, the Bible talks about five crowns. I hope I can get at least four. No, no, no. No, no, no. The only desire in the heart of a believer to gain any such crown should be that we have something to give to him. Because we realize were it not for his grace, we'd have nothing at all. We could do nothing at all. Some of you need to be assured of his love. And when you are assured of his love, things will change. You cannot do it any other way besides getting alone with him and opening his word. Things will definitely change. There'll be a hope in you. There'll be a desire to be with him. There'll be a desire to be fruitful. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. You no longer want to glorify yourself, but your desire will be to glorify the Father by bearing much fruit. And I'm praying tonight that the Lord may help us to express our love to him as he has expressed his love to us. Tonight you may be lost. You're still not convinced that he loves you. Probably, maybe I'm wrong, probably because you have not taken a good enough look at Christ. Perhaps your gaze is constantly upon your unworthiness rather than on his worthiness. Perhaps you see your insufficiency and because of that you've been blinded and you cannot see his all sufficiency. Would you not look to him tonight? I'll give you that quote by Robert Murray McShane. For every one look at self, take ten looks to Christ. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks that such love could be given to us. It is good for us to get a glimpse of what we really are. It is healthy for us to feel and sense the ugliness of our heart and soul. It is a good thing. But oh, how much better it is to see how lovely Jesus Christ is. Help us this evening to be persuaded and convinced of his love. Help us to be thoroughly convinced that the King of kings and Lord of lords loves me. And I pray that it might spark a reaction in us. 
might cause us to hope in such a hopeless world. That it might cause us to chase after him. To long to be with him. To rise early to meet him. That it might cause us to long to be fruitful. To offer something unto the lover of our soul. I pray tonight for those who are lost. Who still have never experienced thy love. Through Jesus Christ thy son. Those who are still perhaps like that. That unprofitable servant who is living in fear. Who thinks that they know who you are, but have totally misjudged thee. I pray this evening thy spirit may reveal unto them the truth of thy character, the truth of their own selves, and may they learn to see the love of Christ and reciprocate it back to him. Help us as thy children to lay up the best fruit we possibly can, to seek thee early, Help us, Father, to desire thee more than we desire anything and anyone else. And may we be ready for thy return. May we store up not treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. Help us, equip us for this, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.